monogamy represents a, a deepening of bonding into a kind of lifelong project that is entirely spiritual. I mean, not that it doesn't have a physical and an ecstatic and, er and an erotic side, but it all is goes together to create something that uh, should not be expected of adolescence and should not be preached as the ideal at all stages of life. And this is pretty much how it's handled uh, in a number of non-literate societies. Marriage is taken very seriously, and uh, but before marriage, uh, a different set of rules uh, uh, obtains. So that's not a solution for those of us who are already into middle age or beyond, but it certainly gives an uh, indication of how we might think about it in raising our own uh, children. I want to add something, if I may. I think the objectification of women, which is not unique, it's only just marketed and packaged so very expertly in the West, but the making women commodities really completely messes up the whole deal. Because if it is just an exchange of commodities, I mean, why stick with one commodity? Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that is not just the Western thing, but, you know, if it's just a collection of body parts, you know, like the pin-up girl or, you know, oh, boy. or boy, right, which is, you know, which is sort of a, a way of getting into that. And I, I think that it, that it really hinges, but it's very much the woman who's been, you know, the objectified one, uh, Joan. You know, I mean, the other one was sort of a kind of a blip of reaction. Uh, in this transitional time. And I think that's something we have to kind of get through before we can really work that out. It's very hard to realize the power of woman as commodity in this society until you uh, are away from it. I remember, well, this happens every time, but I remember particularly <laughs> in the Amazon, we had been about three weeks up this river, a group of about six of us, women and men, <clears throat> and we came to this village, and there was the obligatory uh, meeting with the head man of the village to let them know that we would be collecting plants in their area and so forth and so on. And uh, we had been away from Iquitos by now, I guess, a month, and uh, we came into the Maloka, and it was dimly lit, and then he lit a little kind of a candle. And there was uh, a girly calendar of, of the most innocuous sort. I mean, uh, the kind that spark plug company produced in the United States. You know. it was very mild. And, and um, I was trying to deal with this guy, and I was absolutely riveted. I could not tear my eyes from it. And I was even thinking, it came upon me, uh, was there, was it conceivable that without blowing everyone's mind, especially m the fellow members of my party, could I get this away from this guy? <laughs> and, uh, so, <clears throat> and then I, and then of course, uh, you know, we, other things happened and time passed. And then later I was back in Iquitos and I came upon this same calendar in a, in a libraria there. And it had no power whatsoever because in Iquitos I was saturated in these images, just the news vendors on the street. And this is very mild stuff, you know. It's a Latin Catholic country. But uh, the power of this image is why it's used to sell everything from cigarettes to debentured bonds. It's, uh, uh, and it is dehumanizing. It is dehumanizing because uh, it takes us to literally to the surface. Everything is flattened. This is again this flattening of the primacy of experience, reducing everything to a... Uh, a uh, sensation empty of uh, emotional content. And if you can do it with women, you can do it with anything. I want to stop on that because if, if you take just that away with you, uh, as I think I said sometime either last night or today, 
But what my work indicates is something that once you articulate it, it sounds obvious, but somehow it's been overlooked. And it's very simply this, that the way that a society structures that most fundamental of all relations, the relations between the female and the male half of humanity, because that's what women and men are, that that profoundly affects everything. It doesn't just affect our individual life choices and roles as women and men, which we, of course, experience, you know, very clearly, and, 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 and now we're really aware of it. But it affects every one of our social institutions, and that's really the objectification of women. Uh, the domination of women is the template. It's the model. Because if you can do that to your female twin, if you can do that to the person with whom, whom you have the most intimate relationship, then why not do it to somebody whose difference is not one of sex, but of color or of hairdo or of uh, <coughs> politics or religion. It's the template. It's the model. And so what I really want to say to you is that these issues that we have been so thoroughly socialized to think of as, quote, just women's issues are the central core issues mm -hmm. that we better start paying attention to. Mm -hmm. And I am very definitely making a statement here <laughs> that I passionately want to share with you that I just because it's so obvious you know if you really think about it but we've been so conditioned not to and of course the reason that we're so conditioned to think of it that way is because if once we start thinking of this way then we are challenging the very basis the very foundation of the dominator system and it extends into everything and I really want to say this one thing and it's about language because you've spoken about language uh, I never used to be aware of anything, I think. I mean, I think that's really the only way one can describe my former state. But anyway, but I certainly was not aware. Uh, I was aware of a slight sense of discomfort. Uh, well, more than slight. When I went to college and everything was the study of man and mankind, and all of the examples were male-centered because the message was very clear. I was here, but I really had no business being here. None of this was really directed to me. But it was so you know, wafty away, and I thought I was uncomfortable because I hadn't found the right guy or wasn't wearing the right blouse or, you know, I mean, I had no consciousness. But now it's very clear to me that the whole use of male exclusive language, the term man instead of human, the term mankind instead of humankind, the term he instead of she or he or we, that that's a way of really linguistically almost short circuit circuiting it's really a way of short circuiting any partnership circuitry <laughs> in our head okay and that it's tremendously important oh uh, and I, have you noticed you've been using the word history a lot is it a history and I was thinking you can use the word her story also <laughs> well you know I'm thinking about that because the title of this is the uh, you know a past history I was thinking how about our story yeah, yeah. because I kind of like to move from prehistory to history to our story. <laughs> I, I know that, that sometimes we play with words because we just got married and I had the same experience of feeling uh, real resistance to being owned and all of that. And uh, someone said, uh, Mrs. Charles Brent. Oh, oh and I God. said, I said, uh, no, I, but this is Mr. Linda Brent. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and I think sometimes the reverse of things, it doesn't seem so, uh, I mean, it wasn't that it was awful to be called that because I'm proud to be married to my husband. Um, it was just that you, if you start reversing it that way and how absurd it sounds to call him Linda Brent, mm -hmm. it makes it re then it makes it how absurd it is to call me Charles Brent, you know, <laughs> where it doesn't sound so absurd otherwise. Mm -hmm. So I think when, if, when we start noticing those things, just to reverse them. Yeah. No, I think that's a very, very good thing. Mm -hmm. that you, but this is what, how we're all beginning to notice these things, and it's fun. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. a little uncomfortable, but it's much more fun than that. Well, there's a fellow, uh, Dr. Warren Farrell, who's doing that. He talks about walking mm -hmm. in someone else's shoes. He has interesting workshops because he has the women line up in rows according to their income, and then he has the men stand on chairs and turn around so that the women can see. Them. Oh, I think experiencing it really, really makes a difference. David, you want to add something? Oh, okay. No, you have to get up. Don't you? Yeah. As we see, you know, playing with words keeps us a lot because I think it's coded. And so you can see history as you said, as his story. But mystery 
David wants, I think, to address this issue of dualism. He talked to me earlier. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, no, no, that, that's a very legit perspective. I, I think it's this question of the duality thing. It's so important <coughs> that it needs to be thought through with a number of different perspectives. All I want to share with you is that there's two perspectives that occurred to me after Robin brought it up this morning. See, I see it as absolutely essential for us to differentiate what's partnership versus what's dominant. And it is very necessary to go through this us and them process. And the same, uh, there, there, there's, there's two levels of meaning. <coughs> One is in, in, in philosophy, <coughs> dialectics. You've got, in order to reach any progression, uh, one, one way of looking at it, you've got to state the basis rather powerfully in order to get to the end, antithesis stated powerfully, in order to move beyond that towards the synthesis. What we don't want is the synthesis of the dominator and the partnership, but that's the, well, the philosophical point. The practical point is this. If you look at the way a child grows up, or if you look at how a uh, excluded minority, uh, like the blacks, which is very familiar, uh, advances themselves. In the case of a child, the child almost always has to go through that period. It, comes, it, it, it happens at earlier stages, but it becomes particularly in the focus during adolescence, where in order to differentiate itself from the parent, it hates that parent, goes through that period, I'm not you, I don't want it. So there's that necessary negativity where they're differentiating. Same thing happens with black people, where there's a lot of white people felt awfully uncomfortable with black power. They thought, oh, there's nothing worse than Malcolm X. Well, Alchemax, the whole black power thing, was serving a very important function because it was differentiating. I'm not white. I have nothing to do with white. This was a necessary transition stage. This is it's necessary for a child to go through adolescence. And I feel there's a certain amount of duality that's absolutely necessary as a transition toward a better, better state. But in other words, I, I, I feel that this needs to be articulated because I feel there's a very great danger and saying we don't want to we don't want to have animals. We want everything to be lovely. And yet we do have animals. And, and, and it, it is it, it is the dominator thing and all that it represents. Sure, they you know, these are people that must be dealt with in ways and they are us. Are they, they are ideas but they are ideas embodied in people. They're embodied in us. And and I, I think that this is this is something that we must wrestle with. And, and not a boy. Oh. I just wanted to further discuss that question that we talked about that 
asking the question about that asking the questions about duality what is the smallest unit of partnership and we were talking about that before whether it was two or one you know, whether that that um, conqueror inside me and that partner inside me which is sometimes mind over body when my mind says go ahead and eat something that's not good for me uh, conquers the health that I need to have I'd just like to hear maybe you both talk a little bit about the idea of partnership on an individual basis well, I loved when you when you earlier came and uh, posed that question and said that your your intuition was that the basic partnership really started, you know, within us. Mm-hmm. And I, I I agree with you uh, because uh, it's the whole thing of seeing ourselves as 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 part of a larger whole and honoring our body and honoring our spirit and honoring the fact that they're, you know, they're the same. They're just different aspects of the same. So I, I see it, you know, like, like a prism uh, where, where, you know, you, you just see different facets of it in different ways. And yeah, the, the smallest unit, I think, is, is every one of us. So I thank you for that. Yes, yes. Don't, don't you think that... Uh, there's been talk about ego. Well, it seems to me ego inflation is what happens when within the partnership of the individual, a dominator model is applied because the manifestation of ego is the denial of intuition, which is a feminine function. So people who are strongly egocentric are living in the self-created hell of a dominator society of one. <laughs> Besides the obvious reasons like fear of change and wanting to maintain a uh, status quo or one system, um, why do you think there's this tremendous uh, reaction or fear or backlash by the fundamentalists um, against the resurgence of, uh, I mean, in their literature and, I mean, sermons and everything against the resurgence of the return to the goddess, the archaic, uh, what the New Age movement, um, anything that um, smacks uh, slightly different than their traditional or fundamental values. Well, they are the bearers of the patriarchic standard. They, their lineage reaches right back to Pharaoh, and uh, <laughs> they see it being threatened. Uh, secularism, which began 500 years ago, threatened them at every step of the way. That's why I said last night, I consider uh, this monotheistic tradition to be the single most reactionary force in human history. Uh, Their bailiwick is threatened. The, The energy that they put into destroying the pagan world was uh, tremendously ferocious. It took them centuries. In fact, they never completely succeeded in dismantling uh, uh, the previous world of pagan sensibilities. And they, theirs is, I believe, not a natural position. Rian said this morning, you can do anything you want to partnership. It keeps springing up. It keeps coming back. It has a natural ability to recreate itself. I don't believe this is true of the dominator culture. I believe that it is uh, fragile and frightened and feels itself always being eroded by the simple processes that reside in nature. So it is an untenable position. And if, if you have an untenable position, you have a siege mentality. No, I, I really want to uh, uh, just t- take that to a very uh, uh, personal sense. I think that it is fear and pain that really are the mainspring. And these are the most damaged people, are the ones that really are the most imprisoned. Because we're all imprisoned to some extent still by the dominator model. But in these people, the grip is so fierce and the pain and the fear are so great that it 
I mean, because these things happen on various levels. One is the systems level. You know, systems like all, you know, societies are living systems. Mm -hmm. They tend to maintain themselves, you know. That's just how we know from systems theory. But just on the very individual motivation level, for example, a lot of these women who are so horribly, I mean, who can go around chanting when, when they wanted this poor uh, aging, just, you know, Supreme Court justice to die. Do you remember they were, you know, what was his name? I've forgotten now. Brennan. Uh, beg your pardon? Brennan. Brennan, yeah, they were chanting, you know, they, they were chanting for death for Brennan, and it was all in the name of we, we're pro-life. And it was, wait a minute. Uh, I mean, what kind of, of distortion in these women? Well, it's terror, it's fear, it's, it's pain. And they lash out. And that's exactly, you see, the whole lashing out process. You, you mutilate a child from childhood on to, to be in pain. You know, be it really through genital mutilation or be it through child beating or be it through psychological battering. You know, all of these ways. And that's, I think, you know, I mean, if you're asking in terms of the mechanics of it, it's very complex. But I think on the individual level, that's really, and it relates to your point about the enemy is, if there is an enemy, it is us. I mean, it is, it is what has become part of us, but, but we can leave it behind the pain. And the whole thing that we're talking about now is healing. Healing ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What, what impresses me about this uh, particular subject is really the the call to face the pain. Yes. And instead of looking out there for the source, either be it God or outer space, it's you know, in which which so many of the patriarchal religions head the gaze in that direction, in the skyward direction, and why your question about mind and body. I think it relates to uh, what Rianne is talking about right now. The call that's being made, and I think the same with your work, is to actually face very deeply what's going on within us, the profound alienation between mind and body, the objectification, not just of the feminine, but of eros, the objectification of the body. And um, whether it's you know, with the visionary vegetables or simply by attending to breath and watching the content of our minds produce in the way that they do, coming to really, as you know, the uh, Oracle Adelphi said it beautifully, knowing oneself completely, becoming completely aware, heightened and <coughs> deepened awareness. So, you know, I, I really resonate with, um, with what you're talking about in terms of uh, coming into this partnership model, mind and body, mm -hmm. and how we live this out, you know, in relationship with each other, how actually <coughs> partnering in the world becomes a context wherein we can discover, we get a very extraordinary feedback when we're off, and why this, you know, evasive maneuvers to, you know, stay in relationship, to stay in community, to, to persist through the points of extreme pain that all of us uh, experience in facing ourselves, whether it's on a psychedelic substance, you know, or whether it's sitting on the zafu, mm -hmm. but really knowing oneself profoundly. Can I ask you also oh. why, uh, you know, um, is Muslim fundamentalist white South Africans? Now, they are not in very much space. I mean, they're white South Africans are not generally mutilated. Arab men are not even circumcised. <laughs> what women are they? Are. No, they are. They are. They are. Yes, yeah. <laughs> All right, they are. But um, <laughs> the reason was through, uh, it proves partnership because the fear that they feel that keeps them sitting on top of these other people, that keeps them there is the fear of getting hurt. selective uh, deadening of empathy because I think that empathy this awareness that we're talking about is so much part of uh, this unique miracle that is our species and the dominator model is so fascinating because here's this gift we've been given and institution after institution practice after practice is then ingeniously developed to deaden that gift of empathy in us. And, hey, but I think that that's really but one of the things. Really but you can't really kill it off, you see. No, no, you're right. 
Yes, you're right about that. But I think the point here is that, the, you know, as long as we do not face our own pain, we will create a lot for others. Yes. Wouldn't it? Yes. I mean, yes. the dominating mentality would be like in a prison. I mean, for the state penitentiary. I mean, you would take it that the feeling of, of being incarcerated where you had that much fear, where there was all the, that much power. But see, I think the, the incarceration image is very is a very apt one. Uh, I, I spoke about Theodore Rojak, and he he spoke of how the 19th century wave of feminism really was one of the things, that one of the, the the first really historic frontal challenges to the dominator system, to what he called patriarchy. And he said that uh, the reaction to it was one of of terror, you know. But 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 the greatest thing was we had to keep imprisoned not only, you know, the, the women and the and the so called inferior people and the enemy, but the woman that every man, as he put it, keeps locked inside his psyche. Yeah. And it's I think that's a very apt image. But of course women too can be very cruel and I think it's really very important that we disabuse ourselves of this whole idea that we're talking about, you know, women are terrific and men are, you know, I mean, forget it. Because it's the the, the dominator model distorts both women and it is true that the caring, I mean, that's one of the ironies. You know, the really the most important work in the society, which is the caring and the nurturing uh, work of the society, has been relegated to the inferior group, you know, to women. And then we wonder why we can't have social priorities that are more caring if those very people are excluded from power, right? Mm-hmm. right. I mean, talk about Catch-22 here. Mm-hmm. So we're back to the, quote, women's issues, aren't we? What concerns yeah. me once again is this new role of the feminist man. You know, if you go back and you see these, this image of erotic Pan, who was a consort of the goddess, who, in, if you go into history enough, was often sacrificed at the end of each year as part of this refeeding the goddess back. There was a blood sacrifice since the man did not bleed. But if you look at some of the Minoan uh, frescoes, it's very easy. Uh, they're beautiful, and I wish I had some of them. Uh, the role of the man, well, I mean, you see a, a fresco of a man with fish. He fishes. <laughs> All right? I mean, you know, in other words, it's a productive role. Uh, you see uh, uh, the so-called young prince, which is really fascinating. It's the, uh, uh, most of the recovered Minoan uh, single figures have been a tribute to the goddess with a, a female priestess as the representative. But they find this one figure of a man, and they decide he's the young prince, Right? Uh, which is very, very interesting because there's absolutely not a trace of any, uh, of any you know, king in, in Minoan, all right, in the, in the Minoan culture. But nonetheless, he is a, a, a beardless youth, and he has uh, flowers, you know, and, and plumes, and he's walking through a garden. I mean, it's hardly your, you know, macho warrior image. I mean, there are other things that men can do. Men did the bull leaping, and that was very interesting because it was a partnership with the women. If you look at the bull leaper's fresco, mm-hmm. So they obviously just did all kinds of things. They just didn't happen to specialize in killing. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is it time yeah. already? Yeah. <coughs> One more. Oh my goodness! Yes, I think that we should just. Yes, please. Uh, I, I see technology as a symbol of dominant society, dominant society, and that it's something And I wanted you to address the question if you could of what the interface will look like and how we get to the interface of the partnership society with technology. I see a, you know, like a clash of technology, but I wonder if that's that. I'm so glad you brought that up because that makes a wonderful, wonderful uh, place for something that I really felt that I want to very much address. What I'd like to suggest is that we look at technology as something that is really a human function, a human capacity. From day one, language is a technology of communication, isn't it? Uh, from the, the, the stick that even chimpanzees use, you know, to, to help them dig up plants and what have you, that's a technology, it's a tool. Our tool-making capacity is really an extension of natural functions. I mean, an airplane does something that a bird does, but we've built it. Uh, so I look at technology neither as the villain or as the savior. I look at technology as, a, as something that 
we, I mean, other species have some technology. I think dolphins and, and, and whales probably would if they had hands, you know, because they seem to have a high intelligence, but they don't. So we have this tremendous capacity for making tools, you know, all the way to the most extraordinary things that we're getting today. That, I think, is a wonderful thing, and it can also be a terrible thing. And we're right back to the issue of technology being used using the template of a partnership or a dominator model of society. I'd like to suggest to you that the invention of machines, per se, did not have to result in these dehumanized assembly lines where people themselves became cogs in the machine. I would like to suggest to you that if this prehistoric shift had not happened, that maybe the machines would have been used in a very, very different way. I would like to suggest to you that the great breakthroughs in technology actually came in what we may call more of a partnership-oriented era. In fact, all the basic technologies on which civilization is built came out of that era. They weren't as glitzy as what we've got today, although Minot and Crete had the first paved roads in Europe. It had, folks, it had indoor plumbing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it got lost again. You know, we don't find it again till you know, much later. But, I mean, they, they were what we would call, well, they, they compare very, they're much more high technology than a lot of the so-called developing world today, okay? So uh, let's look at technology in terms of this template, but the dominator system, I've divided technology really, and that's a whole new session, okay? Uh, by trying to categorize it in, in terms of uh, different types of technologies, and one is technologies of, of domination, of destruction, and I'd like to suggest to you that technologies of domination and destruction, be it the use of the greater musculature, <laughs> and the development of this, you know, of the brawn to kill of the so-called classical warrior or the missile, that that's built into the dominator system. And that really doesn't have that much to do with technology at all. And so that the issue for us isn't let's throw out the baby with the bathwater here. I mean, I don't want to go back technologically. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think that we don't want to do that. What we want to do is to use the most advanced modern technology and it almost takes us immediately back to the whole issue of how we use uh, the, the hallucinogens. Because we're right back there. I mean, you know very well that there have been experiments, not with some of the synthetic drugs, to use them for mind control. I mean, that's the ultimate dominator technology, isn't it? I mean, thou shalt not eat of the tree of knowledge because I've just given you in your water supply, you know, the chemical that makes you sort of, you know, completely pliable. Well... Well, I'm saying, no, 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 no. I, I made the distinction between hallucinogens and drugs, you know, and, and, and pharmaceutically produced drugs, and there are experiments with that. But I'm saying that let's think of technology with those two templates, and I'd really like to leave that as my summation. Tomorrow, it's the most powerful brainwashing agent. LSD is the most powerful brainwashing agent in the world. The partnership situation would be democratic. Yes. Sure. And, and of course, the other autocratic. Yes, that's right. And Antarctic. And, and the, uh, the financial, financial infrastructure would be, one would be uh, laissez-faire private ownership, the other would be uh, shared. Socialized. Well, there would be degrees. Or, and might say capitalism and socialism, you know? Maybe well, but that's what it gets it's, it's somewhat oversimplified, but certainly a more equitable uh, re you know, distribution of wealth, wouldn't you say? And an abandonment of the notion of private property. Oh. Oh. No more real estate. Well, see, I, I don't, I don't. They killed a pope for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't have to And say. in tumult. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of ending in two months, could we end just uh, almost on time? Yes. <laughs>
nevertheless, what we have going for us is um, that the partnership way of thinking is really scripted into the bones of the planet. This is how it's always been done. This is how nature does it. The Darwinian model of nature that we've inherited from the 19th century is simply another dominator fiction uh, used to reinforce uh, dominator mechanisms. The fact is that what nature really maximizes is cooperation, integration, and uh, mutuality of support and relationship. What we're really trying to do, what becoming post-historical means, I think, is removing the veil between ourselves and, his and nature that the historical experience has uh, raised, because the historical experience has been an alienating experience, has caused our perceptions to rise to the mere surfaces of things, and our feelings to be completely undercut and invalidated. And what we have to do is feed more deeply into the context of being and the situation in which we find ourselves and to see that we are of it. It's a seamless web. The dynamics that rule uh, the biological and natural world are the dynamics that are going to work for us. We didn't fall here out of the sky. We weren't made by a jealous God who set us loose in a kind of reservation. We are <laughs> of the stuff of this place, and its dynamics can be our dynamics. The problem is one of awareness, realization, recovery of this perception, sharing it, revivifying it, and realizing it. That's all. <laughs> I really have a need to clarify the private property issue uh, because I really don't equate the partnership model with uh, the abolition of private property and I want to really clarify that. Uh, I think that it's much more complex than that and that uh, as I speak in, in the chalice and the blade that what is going to be emerging I hope is a whole new economic model <coughs> where we put in central value the caring work mm -hmm. that has traditionally, of course, been relegated to women and to so-called effeminate men. Mm -hmm. And that that's, we have that opportunity now as we move from industrial to post-industrial society because we have to redefine what is productive work. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to leave it with this idea that I think we, we're going into a post-capitalist and post-socialist uh, post era. And I, I, I just... Forgive me, I don't need to have the last word, but I, I, I did want to have to say that. Well, I'll have the first word tomorrow. <laughs>
Anyway, uh, he's uh, subscribing for McKenna, Johnny Otis, Alan Watts, Roy, and uh, Reggae. <laughs> Terrence McKenna. Oh, the tapes and Terrence's um, appearance in Los Angeles, which is now not two months away, not three months away, not two months away, not a month away, ten days. A week from Saturday, Terrence is going to be in town. More about that in a minute. The tapes of Man and Woman at the End of History. This is a set of, sorry for the squeaky book. This is a set of five cassettes. And uh, they are available from the Ojai Foundation Wild Store. I believe the set of five is $40. Man and Woman at the End of History. Their address and phone... If they answer the phone, I guess they do. It is uh, Ojai Foundation, Post Office Box 1620, Box 1620, Ojai, California, 93023. The Ojai Foundation, Box 1620, Ojai, California, 93023. And again, the seminar is Man and Woman at the End of History. Phone number of the Ojai Foundation, area code 805-646-8343. Area code 805-646-8343.